Welcome to Perspectives, where we take a deep dive into the issues of the day. My name is Ola Torera Majekwedumi Oniru. Our discussion point today is leadership achievements in Africa, our people, our power, our profits, and our politics. Two special guests will be joining us soon, but for right now, let's get started. Welcome back to Perspectives here on Arise News. Nelson Mandela, Muammar Gaddafi, Martin Luther King. The best of leaders have been historic and inspirational, imperfect visionaries, doers and achievers, positively impacting many millions of lives for generations ahead. The systems of power built yesterday form the basis of the model of leadership that will change tomorrow. The model of meritocracy, humanity, and accountability will almost always lead to sustainable development, higher standards of living, and a system of achievements. The model of kleptocracy and apathetic leadership will almost always lead to chaos, untimely death, and incompetent followership. We all think, look, act, and visualize differently, and we are all sitting on different hierarchical seats at any given point in time. But what unites us is leadership that instills peace on earth today and peace of mind for tomorrow. No human is more deserving than the other of peace, opportunities, respect, freedom, unity, and prosperity. Leadership is heartful, delicate, powerful, humane, and progressive. Leadership is passionate, results-driven, and ethical. A nation of citizens who sits up communicate up and achieve up, will attain the changes and the progress desired. Currencies are man-made, hardships are man-induced, freedom is man-protected. The theme at this year's G20 gathering of world leaders is one earth, one family, one future. How close are we to achieving one Nigeria and eventually one Africa? Are we ready to have a permanent seat at global tables of development. More viewpoints coming up with our special guests, but for right now, let's watch this unique report on leadership. What is leadership? They say it's the ability of an individual or group of people to influence or guide followers and members of an organization, society, or team. Leadership often is an attribute tied to a person's title, seniority, or ranking in a hierarchy. But they say, with great power comes great responsibility. As a leader is bestowed with the responsibility of guiding a group of people, organizational nation, ensuring that your best interest is represented in all situations. While some people relish the perks of being in a leadership position, it involves a lot of work. As individuals who take up such positions, a lot of times require protection due to the nature of their jobs, which involves making policies that might not be well received by people, especially political leadership. The profits of being a good leader comes in the form of legacies the individual is remembered by. How they use their position to uplift people that look up to them. Unfortunately, in today's world, a lot of leaders put profit and power ahead of the people. Betraying promises it made during campaign seasons, which in return, has created some sort of distrust between the leaders and their supporters. Today on Perspectives, we will be taking a look at profits of leadership, the politics involved in such positions, and how effective leadership is a benchmark for successful corporations towards productivity and efficiency. Indeed, an interesting report on leadership. We're heading for a very quick break, but do please stay with us because we have more coming up on Perspectives. Welcome back to Perspectives here on Arise News. That was indeed a special report on leadership. Now moving on to welcoming our special guests who are joining us today in discussing leadership across the continent. First off, we have Chris Unwa Oko Bia, who was a notable presidential candidate in 2011, and he is currently a member of the Obidati Presidential Campaign Council in 2023. 
Also joining us is Omoyele Soware, who is founder of the African Action Congress Party and a notable presidential candidate in 2019 and most recently in 2023. Very warm welcome, Soware and Umwa Okobia. Umwa Okobia is joining us from the Abuja studio and Soware is here with us in Lagos. Soware, let's start with you. With a population of over 200 million citizens expected to increase to 400 million, by 2050, Nigeria, Africa's largest economy, faces very significant human development challenges, currently ranking 150 out of 157 countries in the World Bank's Human Capital Index. Where did we get it wrong and what lies ahead? Well, thank you for bringing me. And uh, it's also great to see uh, Chris on the screen on the other side. I think uh, it's very interesting that the World Bank is the one expressing to the world that we are now lacking in uh, human capital development. But what we must understand is that Nigeria was subjected to economic policies that actually degraded its capacity to produce people with capacity. And that was through the structural adjustment programs okay. uh, that was imposed on the military and that was executed precisely to achieve the objective that they are now reporting on. I became an activist. Can you tell us first some of those foremost, policies? Yes, first and foremost, mm -hmm. in 1989, as I was arriving at the University of Lagos, okay. the World Bank was also giving Nigeria a $120 million loan, supposedly to fix our universities. But they knew that we didn't need that loan. What we needed was a leadership that could have invested in education, but the structural adjustment program specifically, mm -hmm. specifically targeted the number of investors. Said there were too many investors. Government had no business investing in free education. But look at it. Some thirty something years later, the people that were half trained okay. by Nigerian universities are now being brought to the UK, Europe, and America as doctors after COVID nineteen hit them. So had we had that opportunity to progress when we started free education, invested in education the way we should, had we had the opportunity to have an unbroken leadership in the civilian sector, we would not have had that break that led to the destruction of that human capital development they are reporting upon. So they are guilty. The World Bank, the IMF, they are guilty of this. They know the kind of policies that they have spread over time. But you know, leadership changes hands. So the leadership then will be different from the leadership today. They, Whoever they, put the report together they will be different from who's they haven't managing changed their ways Because we are still dealing with structural adjustment program. The current dislocation that they imposed on Nigeria through the removal of so-called forest subsidy, it was a World Bank and IMF prescription. And the man who read it on the day of his own inauguration probably didn't even think about the fact that the moment you have 80% of your economy in the informal sector, mm. you just can't come up one day and destroy opportunities that people have to do business and leave. Because you already know the statistics of how many Nigerians are living below $1 mm -hmm. per day. Mm -hmm. And what is $1 today is seven, I mean, almost 950 Naira to a dollar. As of six months ago, the Naira was stronger than it is today. It has depreciated over time. So what I'm saying is that it's not as if we should blame the World Bank and the IMF all the time for, uh, but you would link that with the kind of leadership they also promote. I'm talking about the West on the continent of Africa, the kind of characters they impose. And I, need, I think we're going to talk about you, about this later. You know, since independence on the continent of Africa, what it did, you know, killing the real leaders of Africa who fought for independence. Some of them were killed through coups. Mm -hmm. Some of them were killed through, you know, mysterious plane, you know, crashes. And they have now also started directly, you know, killing people. And you now have reached a point where even military rule has returned to the continent of Africa. Africa is not making progress uh, with the return of the military to power. You now find even a new generation of young Africans who are hailing military Boy Scouts, mm. who are taking over all these um, African and West African countries. That's not progress. Mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot divorce that from the history of Africa, how Africa got to where it is, and the position of these institutions, international institutions, who keep imposing upon Africa economic policies that would not allow Africa to develop, especially 
uh, their position on education, their position on public welfare, housing. You know, when I came to Lagos... So you're in, saying they are currently dictating they are. Africa's yes. status at the moment? Look, the, the, the most powerful person internationally in Nigeria is probably the IMF country director. They can walk into your, you know, your president at any time and tell him, oh, this is not going to work. Even when they say it in private and you don't listen, they call a press conference and say, we are not going to accept Nigeria's economic policy because this is not good for us. But they know what they are doing. They are, they are preparing your country for their factories to dump whatever it is they want to dump on you. It is easier now to impose African, I mean, America's will, wheat on the Nigerian uh, uh, bread industry to mm. make bread. But guess what? The farmers who are growing wheat in America are the most subsidized farmers in the U.S. So how do you compete with a farmer who is subsidized to grow wheat in America and through the WTO, the World Trade Organization, imposes that you must take a certain tonnage of wheat into your country, whether you like it or not? That will kill your, your own local production of wheat, mm. which we are capable of doing. So a lot of people don't know that some of these policies are part of the reasons why they are killing us. And that is why the West don't like African leaders who are conscious, who are brilliant, who understand the mechanics of how they manipulate our economic policies to pauperize us. They like, you know, they like cooking up numbers. You mentioned earlier that Nigeria is the biggest economy on the continent of Africa. I don't know how you came about that. How are we big when the we don't have electricity? You the potentials. Well, maybe potential. potentials. The but how are we big when you don't have electricity? Buoyant. You can't even electrify like mm -hmm. half of a city. Mm -hmm. How can you be big? Yeah. It's not a big economy. Well, let's look at our Nigeria human is assets. the big for nothing, you know, mm -hmm. what fella used to call BBC, big blind country mm -hmm. on the continent of with, Africa. With huge potential. It has huge potential, but, but for you to, have, to get to that potential, you must remove leadership. the roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Leadership is a Absolutely. major, major factor in. Making and sure that's that why Nigeria is in charge of the, you know, the destiny of Africa. The fact that we need ECOWAS to speak to Boy Scouts in Nigeria and all that shows our weakness. Mm. If Nigeria were to be the right country, you know, in position that it ought to be on the continent of Africa, we don't need West Africa to tell our neighbors in Nigeria that they should sustain democracy. Absolutely. Let me bring in Owa Okobia from our Abuja studio. Wow, Kobia, how would you analyze Nigeria's current government and state of leadership in line with what Shore just said? What uh, updates on the judiciary matters ongoing? And do you foresee Nigeria having a seat at global leadership gatherings, including the BRICS and the upcoming G20, within the nearer future? Let me first of all appreciate uh, Arise TV for this uh, incisive um, dialogue, if you like. Let me salute my, my brother there. Um, interestingly, we've come a long way. We were born in the same year. And um, our passion for a new Nigeria, a new Africa, and a new deal for our people is top notch. But let me clearly say that as we discuss these issues, we must locate leadership in Nigeria and in lead Africa in proper perspective. Do we have leaders? And some of my friends will say, oh, at best what we have are rulers who are egocentric, who are self-centered, who are egotistic, and to whom leadership is just about me, myself, and I. I. I think that the way forward for Africa is first to grow leaders who are nationalistic, who are pan-African, and who beyond populism care about their people and about our continent. We need Pan-Africanists who truly will determine the destiny and the fate of the African continent and indeed our people. Um, can Nigeria get into Briggs and perhaps occupy a seat at the United Nations Security Council? The answer is yes, but how? When? And how can we do that? And let me say simply that we must first of all grow leaders who are totally people-centered and people-centric. We must grow leaders who truly care about you and I, who truly care about our country, and who truly care about the masses of our people. Until that is done, you know, th there's a popular cliche that we all grew up knowing, and that obtains even in the deepest 
uh, and, the, and, the, and the most exclusive rooms where policies and global issues are discussed. Charity begins at home. How much charity do you have at home? Um, my brother there noted something which is very germane. Do we have uh, leaders who are able to say to the World Bank and the IMF, to, the, to this extent is yes, and to this extent is a capital no? Because every country that has come out of poverty to promise, every country that has come out of disease and despondency mm -hmm. to greatness, every country that has come out of uh, want to plenty, has policies that are intrinsic, traditional, and natural to it, not policies thrown on her by the World Bank, the Bretton Woods, and the IMF. And for as long as our leaders I have the incumbent president uh, a few days ago saying that he's under pressure to go to war in Niger. If you emerge through a credible electoral process, you don't need pressure to ask Nigerians to do what is right. If your electoral victory, quote unquote, were proper, trite and right, fair and just, all you need to do is hop into the Nigerian uh, presidential aircraft and go to Niger and negotiate with the people. Mm -hmm. But because you lack the moral nexus to so do, because you lack the credibility to so do, because you lack uh, the capacity on account of how you emerged to so do, Nigerians will look at you like the, uh, I don't know how verified the statement is from Burkina Faso, that they know who actually won the last election, so you don't have a right to tell them or school the world on democracy. So I think that that's why I agree with my, my brother and friend. Um, African leaders must ensure that they emerge through honorable processes. African leaders must ensure that democracy means truly what it is. A government of the people, as defined by Abraham Lincoln, for the people and by the people. And when we truly uh, dish and deal service to the people, then we can, as it were, emerge not only as leaders of the West African sub-region, not only as leaders of the Sahel region, but leaders of Africa, because we're the most populous country in Africa. But I think that uh, what we're doing today is a call to the conscience of our nation, a call to the conscience of the political leaders, a call to the conscience of our people, and indeed, a new generation that are saying that things must be done rightly. I, I believe that if we have leaders that are responsible and responsive to the people, if we have leaders that are Afrocentric and African-centered, if we have leaders who are pan-African and pan-Nigerian, then sooner rather than later, the, the global organizations that care and that are sincere will come cutting us. But until that is done, um, a place in the United Nations Secret Security Council is like a wait for Godot. Seeking for a place in the BRICS is like a wait for Godot. And I want to say very strongly as we go on with this conversation that the time has come for us to move away from populism to patriotism and nationalism. Thank we you. need leaders who will care and not, and not let, me, let, me, let, me, let me chisel this home. Um, my brother talked about uh, the fuel subsidy all over the world, in Britain, in the United States of America, in Germany, farmers and farming is subsidized. All over the world, largely energy is subsidized. Why is the IMF and the World Bank telling us that the way out of the morass is subsidy? I think that what leaders must do in Africa and indeed this country is to cop corruption. If I tell you what corruption goes on in the oil sector, you will know that the solution to our problem is not in the removal of subsidy, but in the cabin of corruption. Trillions of dollars, trillions of naira, are stolen by people who are protected by the state, are stolen by people who are protected by the PDP, the APC, and those who politic with our collective destiny. The way out of the morass is to check corruption, not increasing poverty for the masses of our people and making lives better for the rich. Thank That's you. the way to go. We must be African-centric and pan-Nigerian in leadership. We must be African-centric in pan-African leadership. Thank you, Umwa Okobia. Let's bring in Soare for the very next question. 
Sorry, leadership is extremely delicate. Power in the wrong hands can kill millions. We're seeing it not just play out in Africa, but across the world. One must be genuinely passionate about the people you are leading to generate abundant profits using your power of politics. So what makes you believe today that you are an ideal candidate for president of Nigeria? You see, you have to look at power from the point of view of uh, service. And I think Chris had mentioned that, that we have produced over the years very egocentric leaders in this country who care more about themselves, their friends and families, and not the Nigerian people. And you must also look at those of us, particularly those of us who want to claim to be young, where we stood when it mattered most in this country. And I can't say that enough. You see, it's not always true that somebody suddenly decides when they've turned 45 years old, 50 years old, or 60, that they want to change their country. When, as a matter of fact, when your services were needed for the country, when you're in your 20s, you just didn't partake. You didn't partake in fighting for the rights of your people. You didn't partake in fighting for the rights of your mates when you're in the university. And then when it's time for compensation, or compensatory leadership, as I like to call it, you say, yes, we, we love this country. Uh, we want to work for the country. We want to make things work. I come from a long tradition of sacrifice. And when leaders, when people want to choose their leaders, we always say that they should look for leaders who have pedigree, who have integrity, who have history. And I think I fall into all these categories. And leaders who can make sacrifices, leaders who can deny themselves of comfort when it's needed uh, so that their own people can have comfort. Leaders who can uh, speak to issues affecting their people, leaders who can motivate. Because sometimes when people talk about leadership, they think the moment you are president, you should also be the accountant, you should be the doctor. No, leaders who also becomes a human resource center of the country, we can find the best hands to work with, to make the country move forward at all times. That is where people like us come in. Leaders who have education, not literacy. So, so that you can have a good spectrum of understanding of the country that you are planning to lead. You see, I always say this, that Nigeria is not complicated as our leaders make it sound. But what is complicated is that the leaders themselves don't understand the nature of complexity to the point that the only excuse they give you is that, oh, Nigeria is complicated. Oh, Nigeria is too difficult to handle. But you look at the size of Nigeria itself. I studied geography and planning at the University of Lake. That was my first degree. You should ask yourself, how long does it take to fly from one part of Nigeria to the other? Maybe an hour <laughs> to my degree from Lagos, if you have a good aircraft, it'll take you there in an hour. But as a president in the US, a country that has 50 states, of which one state, Alaska, is bigger than Nigeria. One state, Alaska, is bigger than Nigeria. And you can fly from the east coast of the US to the west coast, that is New York to California, for six hours. You are still in the air. But in this country where you can travel from one place to the other in a few hours, is considered or regarded as complex. And then you put in charge of that country. People have no understanding of how to run a country. You have a US that has maybe only 20 ministers. We have 42 here in Nigeria. The US is a country of 250 million people and a country that is in, in trillions. They have maybe 100 and something senators. Here, with an economy of a state, equivalent of a state in the US, we have 109 senators and how many State of uh, House of Assembly, I mean, National Assembly members. All these guys are just wasting resources that should belong to the people. And then we have population. Population has become a blessing to countries. China is blessed with population. They are using it positively. India is blessed with population. But Nigeria has 200 million people. It is not the population that is a problem. It's the population of the thieves that is Nigeria's problem. There are not many, 
but they are the ones who have access to resources that should belong to everybody. How did we get to this conversation that I'm breaking down to you? It's the question you asked me about leadership. Those who ran Nigeria in the 60s, after independence, they were in their 20s. But those who are running Nigeria now, you don't even know their age, which is a problem. So you have a problem of integrity. You have a problem of people with no pedigree, people who are fraudulent in nature, running the country. You're expecting the country, as Chris said, to make progress when the meaning of democracy has been turned upside down. The reason why the people of Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, are making fun of us is because they know that the democracy we claim we are practicing here is not democracy. So what is the difference between a coup plotter in army uniform and a coup plotter in civilian garb? They are the same. The moment you cannot have an organized free and fair election with integrity, you have no moral right to discuss democracy anywhere in the world. Even if it is in Palau, one of the smallest countries in the world, they will make mockery of That's why we're a joke on the continent of, on the, on the West African coast. You know, say Nigeria president said we should go and invade Niger. But had Nigeria had credibility in leadership and integrity, you don't need to go to, you'll be a moral voice. You say to them, look, we are neighbors, I'm sorry, you cannot overthrow your government. Go and wait for another election. Look at them. They are saying they want three years. You know, and I'm sure in three years' time, they would change either their uniform to Agbada. And what I find very sad about it is that in the midst of the conversation, we are still being controlled like marionettes by the West and the East Bloc. You know, people now prefer Russia to America. That is how we got into the situation we are in in the 60s. That whole East and West Bloc, uh, you know, uh, dichotomy, and the use of the African continent mm -hmm. as experimental space for whatever their own ideological things are. I don't want to be controlled by the US, but I also don't want a Putin mm -hmm. <laughs> to be my role model. Let yeah. me throw the same question to our guest in Abuja. Wow, Kobia, are you still with us? You ran for president That's in 2011, right. and in 2023, you supported right. Peter Obi. Can you tell us why you believe he's an ideal president for Nigeria? Let me say clearly first that um, what obtains in our country is a quest for for anybody who truly loves our country, who's patriotic, who cares about the way earth of the Nada to promise. Um, it should be about patriotism and nationalism first. Um, and permit me to use the word, um, my brother will understand me when I say this. Of the, and I think that going forward, we would have and must have to all sit down together as people who bear the scars of military rule. Uh, interestingly, he was in the university about the same time I was. We went through all kinds of um, terror, harassment, and we were harangued by the military. And we stood for the values that we believe in. And let me say clearly that the time has come going forward for all of us to sit down and try to not only redefine leadership in this country, but in Africa, because seven except will wake up like Mo Ibrahim challenge. Seven except African young men and women. And pardon my choice of word, I'd rather use young men and women rather than just the uh, age grade that you call youth. People who think they're vivacious, people who think they are, their commitment is for a new deal and a new day. The time has come for us to unite and walk towards betting a new day, a new deal and a new tendency for Africa. Why did I support Peter Gregory B? Of the, pardon my choice of word again, leading candidates. Uh, he came across as the most passionate. He came across as the most um, uh, determined. He came across as the most patriotic. But what is important for me here is not about the elections that are gone. What is important for me here is, and that's why I'm here passionately speaking to the young people who are listening. It's about how we take back our country for good. Interestingly, that 
was the mantra my brother in the studio, Shaurea, used in his campaign. Take back our country for good. Because if and except we do so, the traditional politicians will not understand the challenge of now, the urgency of now. Uh, and I want to say clearly without equivocation that successive uh, African leaders, successive leaders in this climb, have been more, more perfidious in presenting pan-Nigerian manifestos. They haven't been sincere. It's been me, myself, and I. And as I talk to you, what is important moving forward is for us to challenge those who, either by subterfuge or electoral larceny, claim to be in power today, to think about Nigeria. And because they lack the moral rights, moral nexus, moral capacity and competency to ask the Nigerians to do right. In Nigeria, the language was grab it, steal it, run away with it. And we saw how there was violence, there was larceny, and there was all kinds of brigandage during the last election. In Niger, there was a bloodless coup. And so you ask yourself, where's the moral latitude for Nigeria to say to Nigerians, return to democracy, who indeed is actually democratic. In Nigeria, people are protesting against the way you emerge in power. In Niger, people are celebrating the overthrow of people my brother will call the Boy Scouts. Now, it's about a strong moral question. And the time has come for those who truly care, not only about our country, but about Africa, to begin to ask strong questions, and passionately so. So as we dialogue leadership in Africa and in Nigeria, uh, going forward, I, I will make three strong suggestions. Leadership at the level of the media must become essentially and strongly dispassionate, pan-Nigerian, and truly dedicated to truth. Leadership at the level of the student unions, like we did 30 years ago when my brother was in the Unilag and I was in the University of Nigeria in the Wu campus. This way, traverse this country with um, our brother, Maya Goon, our brother, Nasir Kura and several others, talking about a new day and a new deal, and we were able to organize to engage the political, uh, the military jackboots. The time has come for our young brothers and sisters who are still in the universities to rise up and preach a message strong enough to engage political thieves and looters. And then thirdly, we need a new tendencies of young people in politics, young people in politics who truly care about our country, because we must say to those who pretend to be leaders that it's time up. A highly progressive world expects so much from Nigeria. God has blessed us with amazing munificence and riches ineffable. Apologies to Obafemi Awolowo. And what we do with that great riches ineffable is our collective lot. It was Madiba Mandela who said a long time ago that Africa is waiting for Nigeria to rise up. That when Nigeria indeed rises up, Africa will wake from its slumber. And so there is a challenge of, on the African young people and indeed Nigerian people to give leadership to Africa rather than uh, populism, rather than just uh, prognosis and speculations like we have today. Somebody tells us who did not emerge through free and fair elections that he wants to ensure that democracy returns to Niger. How more hypocritical and sycophantic can that be? You know, okay. that such sycophancy is not the way to go. Such hypocrisy is not the way to go. We need Africans who will wake up to the reality and the urgency of now. Remember what Sir Walter Scott said a long time ago. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Those who try to pretend or those who pretend to be leaders in Africa are essentially deceptive because Leadership is about service. Mitt Romney said some time ago in America when he was running against our brother Bill, uh, Barack Obama, he said something clearly, that leadership shows the way. Unfortunately, what we have in Africa and indeed Nigeria, leaders who are blind by lust, 
blind by wonder lost, blind by, blinded by power, blinded by egocentricity and egotism, blinded by religion, blinded by region, and blinded by everything that does not work for good. So I think that the Thank time you, has Chris. come for us to challenge everyone who steps into politics to do what is proper, right and right. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we return, we have our guest still with us in the studio. More on perspectives when we come back. Welcome back. We're still here on Perspectives discussing leadership across the continent of Africa. Sure, this next question is for you. In analyzing leaders, one must look at their past achievements to predict their future capabilities, especially when they are moving upwards with greater territorial power and influence. Tell me today if there's someone in Nigeria that you believed or still believe had that past achievement be able to deliver results in the future on a presidential level? Oh, I have not seen any of the politicians in Nigeria who shown that they are capable of uh, since independence. To, since independence, I'm talking about, you know, maybe I'll show some kind of bias for Bafemi Awolo because without him, I probably wouldn't have gone to school in the southwestern part of Nigeria. He built a secondary school that I attended when only six kids used to go to secondary school in my village in Ondo State. In one day, after the school was announced, over 50, 150 kids came out of the bush. Some of them they fit, couldn't fit into a shoe. Because why? That opportunity emerged. So I would say Obafemi Awolowo in the educational sector impressed me. And I would say bias. But every other leader that they taught me in primary school were great leaders. When I got to the university, we had to fight them on the streets. So even our history has a problem with telling the truth about these leaders. But I also must say that leadership is not only about political leadership alone. We had great leaders who trained us to be who we are today, people like Ghani Fawemi, the Chima Obanis of this world, Bamidele Aturu. You know, Femi Falano has been my lawyer since 1992, pro bono. They are leaders in their own right, too. And we must continue to celebrate. And the number of young people now that I'm working with, we must continue to celebrate. If I say here and start mentioning names, we'll be here forever because we must celebrate leaders in big places Absolutely. and small places so that we can find the rest, so that they can Absolutely. bubble to the surface. You know, all the young people who risk their life during NSAS. All the young people who risked their life to drive the military out of power, likes of my ego, Lucia Egunda, Chris Wokobi, I've mentioned, Chris himself, Abdul, all those nice leaders of those times, had we appreciated them and treated them the way they ought to be treated, they would probably be the leaders of this country today and Nigeria would be better for it. But look at where we are. We keep recycling the same people who have failed Nigeria and Nigerians. And in sometimes, as Chris was trying to say, we failed so badly that even when the opportunities come to be leaders, we don't have the confidence in ourselves to present ourselves as leaders. I would have preferred a Chris as a presidential candidate in 2023 than for him to be a spokesperson for the candidate he chose. And you know, that's controversial. Because he has pedigree. I know him. But I don't know his candidate. I didn't know him during the pro-democracy era. In fact, he said publicly that he worked with the military, helping them to clear the port. But these are things we must confront. Like, we find ourselves so hemmed into different corners of this world, and Nigeria happened to us, that we don't even have the ability to present ourselves as leaders. You know, when people like me present myself, they say, oh, you don't have experience. I'm asking, what experience do you need? Mm. The only experience I don't have is the experience of stealing. Oh, what have you done before? You have never governed the state. The people who govern the state, can you go to their states and spend a vacation there? Are there roads there? Are there schools there that is one of Africa's top 1,000 universities? Do you have hospitals there that did themselves? can go to if they have a headache. The people who govern states before. So we always keep making that mistake. 
you know, I think it has to do with judgment, even on our part. And that's why I love what Chris said, that those of us who went through the wrong deal must now talk positively about a new deal. And that new deal cannot be by subjugating ourselves or inserting ourselves in opportunities because those opportunities sound popular. Because at the end of the day, it is we who are somehow activists or outrightly against the status quo who get first punished. I've said it to many people in my private. Anybody that won the election among the people they claimed were the frontline candidates would have done the same things. They would have all removed subsidy, including Chris Wokobia's candidate. He said he would remove subsidy. They would be doing the same thing. They would have appointed the same set of people to government. There are candidates in the National Assembly. They have candidates there. Have you heard any one of them said anything about the fuel crisis or the crisis confronting the country? They are busy collecting their own allowances. Just like the PDPs are collecting, the APs are collecting, they are fighting for positions that will enhance their own personal interests, their own candidates. And, but again, it is important that these positions are very clear. That's why when people see me and say, oh, maybe you should go for a smaller position, you know, I don't think small. So I can't fit into a small place. I'm a person who thinks outside of the box. Are you getting my point? And what would a smaller position do to rectify Nigeria's problem when the people creating Nigeria's problem are in big positions? So to fix the problem, you must also take the biggest position so that you can solve the big problems afflicting and affecting the country. And at any rate, why should anybody say to some of us, I'm 52 years old, Chris is probably about my own age too, at 52, that we cannot govern a country that is just one state in America. When we have invented ideas, we have stood up for this country when we were in our 20s, we have put our life down on the line when nobody wanted to do it. So many of the people who are in Nigeria today in a position of leadership, when we were fighting against the military, they were hiding under their beds. The mistake the pro-democracy movement made was after 1999, we should not have just dispersed like that. But our position is that the democracy we saw in 1999 wasn't the democracy we fought for or we were fighting for. And we're right to a large extent. But what we should have done is to have stepped forward as far back as our period to take control of the reins of power and let people enjoy the benefits of democracy. Yes. We left it for people who had no idea how we fought for democracy. And this is what they are giving you now, what I call Shege crazy. Let me bring in Uwa Okobia for his final thoughts. Uwa Okobia, what are your final thoughts on people, Let me say, politics, power, and profits across the continent of Africa? Go ahead. Let me say clearly that in no uncertain terms, I, I agree largely with my brother there. I, we have made our mistakes as young people. We perhaps have left our collective destiny after having gone through the trenches uh, in custody of several types, uh, the DSS, the police, the DMI and the likes, having fought through sorrow, tears and blood for what we today have and what came on board in 1999. Uh, we may have made our mistakes, but it is never late, like my late dad would say, never late uh, than ever. Uh, I think that the time has come for us to wake up and challenge leadership to responsible and responsive action. And like you asked him, um, I think that our generation will offer the best of leadership because we are the, we are the T junction. We are the, uh, the bridge between the 1960s, I'm 52, he's 53, were the bridge between the 1960s and the new day. And I think that uh, those who are the heroes of the present uh, leadership uh, challenge are those young people who we must uh, gladly and strongly give leadership. Those, uh, my daughter who was uh, involved in the feeling of the NSAS protesters, the NSAS people who stood out and said, never ever again are they going to cower and watch uh, people who are largely uncaring largely unpatriotic, 
hold their nation by the jugular. Thank you. And interestingly, it is that generation of young people, just a moment, it was that generation of young people who populated the obedient movement. It is not necessarily about Peter or B, like I always tell people. It's about the quest for a new uh, dispensation in leadership. It was about the quest for a new day and a new deal. But I think, and I agree with Chore, that we can actually give these young people the leadership they desire and they deserve. And the time has come for us to go back to the trenches and come out with something better for the masses of our people. And Absolutely. so I say to uh, my brother and to those who are listening, 2027 is next door. We must work together to salvage and redeem our country. Okay, final words from you, Soare. Um, You know, our deal is not over yet, so there can be a final word. <laughs> but I just uh, like to say, as we say to ourselves in the trenches, that, uh, you know, uh, the struggle continues until we attain total victory and liberation of our country. Absolutely. That's my final word for now. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You the so strongest much. force of genuine progressive leadership is a complete migration from self-serving to selfless servanthood of people, profits, politics, and power. Every Nigerian deserves, every African deserves, every human deserves a good life of natural abundance, equality, inclusion, peace, happiness, and love. Meritocratic leadership and greater humanity are two keys to a better world today. Our world needs a much stronger dosage of progressive leadership, healthy followership, and intrinsic happiness. I am Ola Torera Majekodumi Oniru. Thank you for watching Perspectives. Thank you to our special guests for joining us today. Have a very great weekend and see you all soon. Goodbye.